Good evening and thank you for joining me on Black News Tonight. I'm Mark Lamont Hill. The case against disgraced singer-songwriter R. Kelly continued today. <clears throat> Geronda Pace testified for the prosecution, saying that the controversial R&B singer wanted her to dress like a Girl Scout while he recorded their sexual activity on video when she was just 16 years old. The now 28-year-old soon-to-be mother is the first star witness for the prosecution. R. Kelly has pleaded not guilty to the nine-count indictment accusing him of organizing managers, bodyguards, and others to help him lure women and girls into his ring for illegal sexual activity as he toured. A Proud Boys member admits to threatening Reverend Raphael G. Warnock with death during the special Senate runoff in Georgia on January 6th. Edward Florea, a member of the far-right hate group, pled guilty to making various threatening posts towards now Democratic Senator Warnock, including, dead men can't pass laws. The 41-year-old man from Queens, New York, also posted threats on January 6th on the controversial conservative social app Parler. He urged people to, quote, unleash some violence. Florea now faces up to 15 years in prison. <clears throat> a federal appeals court upholds a Texas law banning a common abortion method. The appeals court ruled in favor of the measure passed by Texas lawmakers in 2017 that prohibits dilation and evacuation. That's an abortion procedure commonly used to end second trimester pregnancies. Critics of the ruling cite that Texas has one of the most alarming maternal mortality rates in the United States, with black mothers dying during childbirth twice the rate as white mothers. The contentious abortion law will likely now go before the Supreme Court. A new study finds that some COVID-19 vaccines lose efficacy against the Delta variant. Protection against the now more widespread Delta variant of the coronavirus weakens within 90 days whether a person gets two shots of the Pfizer, BioNTech, or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, either way, uh, it's still ineffective according to, or less effective. According to a British public health study, the new findings come as calls grow to give booster shots to the fully vaccinated, despite a number of countries around the world lacking vaccines for their initial vaccination programs. The U.S. plans on making booster shots available on September 20th to all vaccinated adults. The European Union responds after South African activists and critics call on the EU and Johnson & Johnson for importing vaccines from South Africa. The WHO Director General recently voiced his surprise over the news of J&J &J vaccines being ex exported from South Africa to the EU because more vulnerable people have yet to be vaccinated in African countries. According to the EU officials, the agreement for Johnson & Johnson vaccines from South Africa was reached after J&J &J ran into production issues in the U.S. They also say the agreement is temporary with plans to donate doses to Africa. We'll see. The federal government intentionally sought to discourage the global movement against police brutality that rose up following the killing of George Floyd last summer. That idea comes from a new report that was released yesterday. This report claims that authorities went after Black Lives Matter with harsh prosecutions and a range of surveillance tactics designed to discourage black people from exercising their right to protest. The report is titled, Struggle for Power, the Ongoing Persecution of Black Movement by the U.S. Government. And it came about through a partnership between the Movement for Black Lives and the Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Clinic at CUNY Law School. Joining me now is one of the report's editors, CUNY Law Professor Ramzi Kassem. Professor Kassem, welcome to Black News Tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I have a quote from the report. It says that, quote, the empirical data and findings in this report largely corroborate what black organizers have long known intellectually, intuitively, and from lived experience. What is this thing that we've all known? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Mark. Um, and and you know the what we found uh, through this report, um, you know, we, we we came to look at as confirmations of uh, of really what what organizers in the black community have known across generations, which is that any time um, black-led movements for racial justice gain momentum in the United States, um, there is 
a quick reaction by the federal government to seek to disrupt and discourage that sort of mobilization for racial justice. And the present historical moment is no exception to that trend. You know, just to be clear from our audience out there, what we're saying here is that there was a Black Lives Matter moment and a movement. That movement was targeted by the federal government to watch, to surveil, to intensely prosecute folk. That this was a concerted effort. And the reason I'm making this clear, Professor, is because there are a lot of people out there that always say, oh, you think it's a conspiracy. Oh, y'all are conspiracy theory. It ain't, it, it, it's, it's not uh, paranoia if they're really watching. You know, so help us understand here, where did the directives to target BLM protesters come from? Yeah, that's exactly right, Mark. It's not paranoia when it's actually happening. It's not paranoia when they're being hyper explicit about it. Um, you know, we had we had maybe a couple of hours um, where where former Attorney General Bill Barr um, expressed some sympathy for uh, for you know black protesters in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. But overnight, literally overnight, the rhetoric shifted. Uh, at very high levels of the federal government. So there was no secret about it. There's no conspiracy. Um, senior government officials, including the attorney general and the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, were very explicit about designating uh, organizers for social justice as violent agitators, even though there was no empirical basis for that sort of exaggeration. Um, and, and then the attorney general, Bill Barr, very explicitly um, redirected the efforts of the nationwide network of 56 joint terrorism task forces led by the FBI to focus on the movement. Um, and so again, this was no historical aberration. It's, it's happened uh, time after time in the history of the United States, but this is the latest expression of this historical theme. This report represents a kind of solidarity between uh, the Movement for Black Lives and the Clear Clinic at CUNY. Um, why was this something that you and your colleagues at the law school wanted to be a part of in the first place? Well, two, two reasons, Mark. We, we've had a longstanding relationship with uh, various leaders and organizers uh, within uh, the, the nationwide formation known as Movement for Black Lives that includes 150 plus uh, black-led grassroots organizations. We've advised um, organizers and activists who have been approached for questioning by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies over the years. So there's, there was a long-standing relationship and trust built uh, before the murder of George Floyd and many others, named and unnamed by the police. Um, so that was, that was the, the first reason. But the second reason is that CLEAR has worked um, primarily with Muslim-identified communities, both black and non-black communities, since 2009. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's important to name, identify, and go after our common enemy. And our common enemy is white supremacy in all of its forms. Um, and it's only natural for, um, you know, Muslim-identified communities who are not black uh, to take their lead from communities that have the most experience in dealing with that particular enemy, and that's the black community, and that's, uh, you know, native communities. What policy demands do you hope are made as a result of this report? I mean, it's powerful to know that the attorney general, the president, all these people are targeting. It's important to know that we ain't crazy, and everybody out there that knew that we were being targeted were correct. All that's helpful at the emotional level, the psychological level, even the tactical level. But there's a policy demand that I think can come from this. What do you think it should be? Well, well, there's a, the sort of obvious and immediate uh, policy question, which is, um, you know, Trump very transparently targeted the movement to defend black lives, this unprecedented mobilization for racial justice. He sicked the apparatus of the criminal punishment system, the federal criminal punishment system, on protesters. We've analyzed this, these 326 cases and determined that, uh, you know, these were cases that if they were going to be prosecuted at all, you would have expected to be prosecuted in state court under state laws, but they were brought federally. The federal government stretched its jurisdiction in order to assert federal charges because those are more punitive. So the immediate question is, why is the Biden administration embracing uh, the line that was drawn by the Trump administration. Why are these cases still being prosecuted uh, when it's very, it's clear as day that the only reason these cases were brought federally was not because of any kind of federal interest, but transparently to disrupt the movement in defense of black lives that we saw sweep the nation. So that's the, the first question. And, and I guess the deeper question in terms of policy 
is that the findings in this report confirm what organizers have been calling for, and particularly organizers in the movement for Black Lives Formation, which is uh, to think of ways in which we need to um, divest from police and from the carceral system and redirect those resources to the things that make communities, uh, you know, black communities, communities of color and communities generally safer. Uh, you know, employment programs, healthcare programs in this pandemic, educational programs, all of these could benefit from the staggering resources that right now are devoted to the criminal punishment system uh, and to the police state and to the security state in the United States. Professor Kassam, thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. We really appreciate your insights. Everybody, stay with us because we're going to continue to cover this. We're going to continue to have this conversation. Dr. Peniel Joseph from UT Austin and Ashley Woodard Henderson, an activist from the Movement for Black Lives, will join us. And we'll continue to have this conversation about the United States government's targeting of black protest movements. You don't want to miss this. Stay right here.